Uh, welcome all. Uh, I'm David Kramer. I'm the director of the Library of the Jewish Theological Seminary, and it is a real privilege tonight for us to sponsor a book talk by Professor Mel Skolt. Uh, he has done these talks for us before, and he is a very old friend of JTS and the library. Uh, I recall when the capability to do significant digitization first came available, uh, and we've gotten our collection, Mordechai Kaplan's diaries, the vast majority of them. Uh, and we, were, we got the offer of some money to digitize the diaries. We were interested in making the diaries available online. Uh, but Mel had been working on these volumes and making selections and editing and the like uh, already for a number of years. Uh, and so I went to Mel and I said, what would you think about our digitizing and putting the images of the originals online? And he responded immediately uh, that that was the most wonderful thing that thing, he thing, 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 thing. Um, And so we did that, but of course, selection and careful reading uh, remains eternally important. And so Mel has continued this project uh, and we are here this evening in order to enjoy and to celebrate the publication of his latest volume of selections from the Kaplan Diaries. As many of you know, uh, Mel Skolt is one of the world's great experts on uh, the writing and thought and influence of one of the 20th century's most influential Jews, uh, that is to say Mordechai Kaplan, uh, and he is of eternal relevance. And Mel as a, um, an interpreter uh, and someone to guide us through that material uh, is the best we can get. So we're really thrilled that he's here tonight in order to uh, help us with those insights. Uh, before I begin, let me just remind everybody, please do um, mute yourself so that we don't have any background noise, any echo. Uh, in addition, if you have questions, uh, Mel asked that rather than people speaking up at the end or trying to follow hands on screen, the easiest way to do this would be to, um, for you to share questions through chat and I will, take the questions and ask them to mail at the end. The other thing I want to add, as you may already have noticed, uh, we have got uh, a sign language interpreter with us this evening, Craig Fogel. Uh, we got requests um, for this service and we're happy to do it. Uh, and it looks like it's working out well. So first, let me say thank you, Craig, for doing this. Um, and uh, we hope to be able to offer the same service in the future. Uh, Mel, I'll pass it off to you. The only thing I wanna say is let me know when you want me to share the screen and I will do that at your prompting. Um, so welcome, Mel Skolt. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure, but I'm gonna say to be here I'm in my own house, <laughs> but virtually at the seminary. Um, just one uh, uh, footnote to what David has just said. Um, when you uh, ask a question in chat, I appreciate it if you direct it not to everybody so we don't see it while I'm speaking because that's distracting, but direct it to David um, uh, when you write your question on, on chat. So the point is that many of you know that I have been wandering um, in the diary of Mordechai Kaplan uh, since 1972. That's 40 years. Um, the Midrash says um, about wandering um, that we must, uh, uh, that we wandered in the desert because the desert is empty. And the Midrash says you must make yourself into a midbar, into a desert, so that you are ready to receive the divine word. 
Now, I don't want you to get me wrong. I'm not saying that Mordechai Kaplan is God or Mordechai Kaplan is a prophet, but I have experienced many revelations. I have climbed the mountain many, many times through Mordechai Kaplan's, um, with Mordechai Kaplan's help. Um, and sometimes I emerge from my study and I say to my wife, I'm a piffing, um, as in epiphany, because I have grasped some great truth uh, from Mordechai Kaplan. And I have tried to share those truths with you. I want to begin with the Devar Torah, because the rabbi said, uh, if you don't have a Devar Torah, it's Sicha Levatala. Uh, it's a wasted conversation. And so I want to begin in talking about not the present Parsha, but a few Parshas back, uh, Parshiot back, which uh, dealt with Rebecca. You remember Rebecca goes the extra mile. Uh, remember that uh, uh, Abraham sends his servant Eliezer to look for a wife for uh, Isaac. And uh, when he comes to the well, everything important, I think in Genesis and Exodus happens at the well. Um, uh, so it's, it's, if you find out where the well is, I advise you to, to go there right away. Uh, in this case, Rebecca offers to one of the camels for uh, uh, Eliezer. And I Googled camel and I found, <laughs> I found out that a camel can hold up to 20 gallons of water. So I think that the Rebecca uh, watering the camels of Mordecai, of Mordecai Kaplan, uh, watering the, cam the camels of Eliezer uh, was a, uh, uh, a very great uh, effort on, on her part. Now Kaplan in 1918 gave a sermon um, on the eve of the 19th Amendment giving women the vote. And it was uh, a wonderful a spiritual moment in which uh, uh, Mordechai Kaplan proclaimed um, uh, uh, the changes and the importance of women entering politics. And we, of course, with Kamala um, Harris, are on the eve of such a important uh, development with the possibility that in a number of years, we may have uh, uh, a female black uh, president. Uh, and so Kaplan's words um, are very, very fitting. And what he says is the following. David, can I have the first text? And there we are. So this is from uh, a sermon delivered on November 2nd, 1918. Women will purify politics make industry more humane and make justice to the consumer instead of profits to the producer, the standard of the market. Emancipation is not aimed at power, neither her own particular power nor that masculine power which has contributed so much to the destruction of the world. Kaplan was a feminist from the word go. As Hannah so eloquently, Hannah, uh, from uh, Shmuel Olive Samuel, the first book of Samuel, put it in her hymn of thanksgiving to God, for not by strength power shall man prevail, lo b'choach yigbar ish. Can we go back to the uh, other screen? Now, the, uh, the point is that uh, I think what we have here really is uh, women as the chosen people. Uh, Kaplan's strong point is in the ideals, uh, and he sets before us a goal, which, however unrealistic in a certain sense, uh, does give us a direction uh, for the uh, way in which women will operate in politics. And it's very, very exciting to consider uh, uh, that possibility. So with reference to the diary, I first discovered the diary in 1972 when I began to work on Kaplan. He took me into his study at one point and opened the closet 
and there, floor to ceiling, were the um, the books of the of the diary, large account account type books um, uh, from uh, a floor to ceiling. Uh, his colleagues at the seminary, um, uh, who were all very well known, uh, all wondered what was in the diary and what he has been writing about them. The diary, uh, but they would never know, but we're going to know, uh, or you're going to know about uh, uh, Gordas and Finkelstein and <laughs> the Ginsbergs and so on and so forth, if you get a copy of this uh, volume. This diary is one of the largest in history. Uh, I think it's even larger than Pepys and larger than Emerson. Uh, it is certainly the largest Jewish diary. It is 27 volumes long, 27 volumes long, some 15,000 um, pages. And so you can understand how I have been uh, uh, involved. Uh, uh, I hear somebody's voice. Uh, how I have been involved in the diary all of these years. Hello. The Hello. great events of the day are in court recorded. Do you hear somebody talking? Yes, some people are unmuted. Yes, I'm, I'm, lo I'm looking for them to mute them. Yes. Muted themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm for them. If, if, I, if I mute everybody, we won't be able to hear. You know what, I'm gonna mute everybody uh, and then Mel, you'll have to unmute yourself, okay? Okay, uh, okay, so mute everybody. Um, Okay, there we go. Mm -hmm. You're good. Uh, so the great events of the day uh, are recorded in the diary. And today is December 7th, um, the attack on Pearl Harbor. So Kaplan notes it, but I think it's very well to remember that Kaplan didn't know what was going to happen as a result of that attack, how long and how terrible the war was going to be. I mean, I'm thinking about the fact that the entry in the diary is very brief. And uh, what he says is the following. He says, when I was through teaching at the Institute this evening at five o'clock, one of the students told me he, uh, he had heard over the radio that Japan had bombarded Manila. He made a mistake. He didn't understand. Then he corrects that the next day and had declared war against our country. God knows what is in store for us now? Uh, now is a time to be prepared for the worst and to hope for the best. Kaplan, of course, comments extensively on the war in the course of this volume um, and uh, on Nazism. Uh, he was very, very concerned about the nature of Nazism because it was a kind of nationalism. He didn't, of course, know about um, the concentration camps um, and the horrors. He knew about Hitler's uh, program to destroy the Jewish people and he comments on that and he was very, very concerned about that. Um, but what uh, occupies his mind most is the welfare of all nations, of all peoples and the, particularly of the Jewish people and how uh, the, uh, it will be possible to uh, protect the Jews, and that can only be through uh, uh, democracy. There's a great deal on the nature of democracy in this volume as a way of preserving the welfare and the safety of the Jewish people. Um, so um, the point is that, that uh, in terms of the content of the diary, Kaplan once said that uh, sometimes he had ideas which were too complicated for his congregation at the SAJ, and they were too radical for the rabbinical students at the JTS. And if that was the case, where was he going to put them but in the diary? So the diary concerns uh, uh, the most radical uh, version of, of Mordechai Kaplan. Uh, and I would like to uh, uh, advocate that there is something which is called, which I would like to call diary consciousness. 
In other words, when you get, when you, uh, uh, I was going to say get on television or radio, or when you write an article or you write a book, you have to have a consistent point of view. Um, and, uh, but the diary itself, by its very, very nature, uh, encourages multiple points of view. In other words, you get up today and you feel one way, and you get up tomorrow and you feel another way. And you don't necessarily cross out today what you wrote yesterday, but you leave it there. And so it is by its nature a, a vehicle that encourages pluralism. And the fact that Mordechai Kaplan uh, 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 wrote uh, and created one of the longest diaries on record shows that the matter of pluralism goes to the very essence of who Mordechai Kaplan was. Um, and, you know, people talk about Kaplan and they say Judaism is a civilization, the bat mitzvah, blah, blah, blah. And those things are important. But uh, there are a number of elements which I feel are basic to the way his mind works, which are uh, uh, instructive for us. And uh, uh, Kaplan very often uh, stands on both sides of an issue. And that can be quite uh, frustrating. But I think the pluralism is basic to what he is, and it encourages us to be expansive. It encourages us to be to entertain radical ideas, though they may be disapproved of by uh, uh, the community. Um, I think Kaplan is an embodiment of uh, the famous statement from Walt Whitman, who says, I am large, I contain multitudes, I contradict myself. And that's, uh, uh, Kaplan quotes uh, Whitman in the diary, not a lot, by the way, but he does quote him. Um, uh, so Kaplan, um, uh, at one point, defined uh, Jewish civilization as the living energy of the Jewish people. The living energy of the Jewish people. And Kaplan was involved in preserving that energy and in nurturing that energy. And I think if you remember one thing about the what we ought to uh, uh, remember from Mordechai Kaplan, it's that we ought to learn to nurture and we ought to dedicate ourselves to uh, uh, nurturing that living energy of, of the Jewish people. But the point is that there's a paradox here. The paradox is that these thoughts in the diary are very passing thoughts. And I understand that. And what I have done in, in terms of editing these volumes is to take the passing thought of Mordechai Kaplan and make it into, a, in a sense, a permanent thought. It enshrines it in the written word. And that is, in a sense, a paradox. Well, the point is that, uh, uh, despite that paradox and despite the discomfort that I sometimes feel, I mean, I suppose uh, there's part of my head that believes we should have left it in the rare books of the Jewish Theological <laughs> Seminary and let the scholars go up there and, and go through those 27 <laughs> volumes rather than publish any part of it. But I think, I think Kaplan uh, intended that it be published. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. Because in his will, he said it may not be published until five years after his death. So he expected it perhaps after that to be um, um, uh, published. Um, so uh, the point is that the diary turns out to be um, uh, Ka Ma Kaplan's main vehicle of creativity. Um, and uh, he regretted the fact that he wasn't creative in other ways, and he gives voice to that uh, uh, in text number two. David? Mm -hmm. um, share screen, Microsoft. Share. Uh, disappeared. Text number two. In my frustration, I turned to frustration and not being able to, to create. I turned to this journal as the only means left to me to externalize and render transferable that aspect of my being. I experience as my soul, myself, uh, and my reason. And so the point is, we can go back to the other screen. Uh, the point is that the diary 
in other words, contains his very self. We are, in a certain sense, inside his head. And um, um, that head is a very interesting head. He talks about the institutions that he was part of. He talks a great deal about the seminary. Mm -hmm. If you are interested in the seminary, this volume, especially, and the other volumes are a gold mine of information. Um, he talks about the SAJ, of course. He talks about um, uh, institutions in their inception, one of which was Camp Ramah, which started out in his living room. Uh, Kaplan was um, uh, a, a bit skeptical because he thought that it would uh, necessitate $100,000 in 1945 in order to start Camp Ramah, and he wasn't sure where that would come from. The University of Judaism also begins with Kaplan. Uh, he had the idea it was in his mind, University of Judaism in Los Angeles, of course. Uh, Kaplan has in mind um, uh, the Hebrew University plus a rabbinical school, I think, this, which would be non denominational. I think that's what he was really interested in. Um, he also, in the diary, comments on philosophical issues a great deal his belief in God and prayer, morality, uh, the Torah. Um, uh, ritual, prayer, all these things are in the diary in uh, abundance. Well, what he's looking for is he's looking for what will work. Kaplan was a pragmatist and he wanted to uh, uh, look at the uh, what will work as the uh, essence of any particular prayer or ritual or whatever he's thinking about. If it doesn't work, you have to change it. And if this is another thing, that I wish people would emphasize when they think about Kaplan is his pragmatism. Um, if it doesn't work and you can't make it work, then you have to discard it. And that's what he does. Um, with the best example, the easiest to understand is the idea of Kohen Levi in Yisrael in connection with uh, the services and in connection with the privileges that each one has. Um, uh, and he discarded that. Uh, it is not part of the Reconstructionist uh, mode of dealing uh, with these honors in the, in the synagogue. Now, one of the most interesting things in this uh, volume is the excommunication of uh, Kaplan. Uh, I assume that most of you are aware that in 1945, Kaplan was excommunicated by a group of um, ultra-Orthodox uh, Jews and um, uh, this uh, excommunication, some people are very surprised to find out that the Jews had excommunication. Remember, Spinoza, of course, was excommunicated. It was a way uh, that uh, uh, the traditional community dealt with the matter of dissent, uh, was to excommunicate somebody and put them outside the Jewish community. Uh, the, uh, uh, excommunication in connection with the Sidur actually begins with Kaplan's Haggadah. You remember Kaplan um, created a Haggadah in 1941, which the members of the faculty of the seminary were very, very upset with. He changed all kinds of things. He left um, the plagues out. He included Moses and so on and so forth. And so the, uh, uh, the Haggadah itself is mentioned in the uh, 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 transcripts uh, that were published of the excommunication. Uh, and uh, so what I wanna say, you see the point is that, that the publication of the Sidur came out in April of 1945 and Kaplan was excommunicated. The ceremony took place in, in June and uh, it's not possible for them to get the whole thing together so quickly. So obviously they were anticipating uh, from the time that the Haggadah uh, came out. The excommunication ceremony takes place at the McAlpin Hotel, which is in Herald Square opposite Macy's. <laughs> and I always, I, I, that's a, so an amazing thing. Macy's in a certain sense is the center, you know, of the retail world of the capitalistic world uh, and of uh, uh, many people's um, uh, way of organizing their, their lives, one might say. Um, 
and here this bizarre uh, a ritual uh, from the Middle Ages is enacted uh, uh, across the street. Um, now the uh, documents uh, concerning the excommunication uh, say that anybody that's connected with uh, the excommunication, anybody anybody that's connected with the Sidur is excommunicated. And uh, uh, so it was not only Kaplan, but the uh, people that contributed to the Sidur and Kaplan included a prayer based on a Heschel essay, which I'm going to mention later. And so one might say that Heschel was excommunicated along with Kaplan. Nobody has ever said that besides myself, <laughs> which is a kind of outrageous. But the point is that I want to emphasize um, uh, the seriousness of this matter of the excommunication. Kaplan was not a member of the Orthodox community, of course, but he was very, very upset with the excommunication. David, uh, text number three. Where are we? Text number three. What a shattering effect this exhibition of moral degeneracy on the part of men who call themselves rabbis has upon me. I can hardly express. Truth to tell, I experience neither the sufferings nor the consolations of a martyr. I don't know if he expected to be burned at the stake, uh, but the <laughs> but the point is he was obviously very upset. Maybe we can go back to the other um, screen. Okay, so as long as I'm talking about the Sidur, uh, I want to uh, talk about a little bit about Kaplan in prayer. Um, uh, Kaplan, of course, did not believe in a supernatural God. He did not believe in petitionary prayer. In other words, when people talk about prayer, they always define it as asking for something. And the idea is that something in the world would change as a result of your asking. Petitionary prayer. Kaplan called that magic, and he rejected it. He believed very, very strong. You know, there are people who uh, mock uh, uh, Reconstructionists and followers of Mordechai Kaplan, and they say that Reconstructionists pray to whom it may concern. Well, the truth of the matter is that according to Kaplan, the, the prayer in a certain sense is addressed to oneself. In other words, prayer is meant to change not the world, not the outside, but to change oneself, to elevate one's consciousness, to make one more aware of the ideals to which we ought to be um, dedicated to express our fears, to express our hopes. And uh, 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 it, it, this is, if it's done right, this is what it is. And I want to uh, uh, startle you, I hope, um, by uh, a excerpt from the introduction to this volume, to the uh, prayer book. Uh, David, can we have the next uh, text? This is from the introduction to Kaplan's prayer book. The introduction. This is Mordechai Kaplan. I want to emphasize how important prayer was to uh, Kaplan. And this illustrates it perfectly. If prayer is to be genuine, and not merely a recital of words, the worshiper must, of course, believe in God. But there's so many people out there who don't, who think they don't believe in God, but <clears throat> uh, uh, Kaplan says that in order to pray, you must believe in God. He must be able to sense the reality of God vividly as an intense personal experience. Each of us should learn to think of himself as though he were a cell in some living organism, which in a sense he actually is, in relation to the universe of the, or the cosmos. What we think of as a coherent universe or cosmos is more than nature. It is nature with a soul, nature with a soul. But what I want to stress is the reality of God vividly should be felt in prayer. And that's Mordechai Kaplan, and very similar to something that Heschel might say. Can we go back to... Uh, So uh, there's some people who think that Kaplan was an atheist, 
And Kaplan is very, very, very far from being a, 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 an atheist. Um, the core of his um, thought is um, religious. The core of his thought is pious. And Kaplan thought about God all the time. And he expressed his beliefs about God in terms of the concept of salvation. That is um, bothersome to some people because they think of it as um, Christian. It's a salvation is a good biblical concept, Yeshua, and so on. Um, um, Kaplan uh, defined it as the goal and end of religion, which is defined in different uh, ways in different periods. Um, and in uh, modern times, it's defined in terms of our self and our striving. The goal of religion is not to conform to some tradition. The goal of religion is to express oneself and to, I would say, to express one's Yetzer Hatov. I want to start a movement for the Yetzer Hatov. Most people talk about the Yetzer Hara. Uh, David Kramer is a great Talmudic scholar, and I would be interested sometime to talk about the rabbinic ideas on the Yetzer Hatov. Uh, which I think we very rarely talk about. Uh, let's go uh, to the next text, which deals with the matter of Kaplan's notion of salvation. In the yearning for salvation, this is from uh, volume two of my volumes. In the yearning for salvation, for life's worthwhileness, for truth, goodness, and beauty, for their own sake, for freedom, justice, and peace in society, man experiences something superhuman or supranatural. Not supernatural, but supranatural. In other words, one experiences in the yearning for all of these ideals, one experiences something beyond the natural or the natural push to the ultimate. I would say that is the core of Kaplan's theology. One who experiences that yearning in himself cannot be so vain or unreasonable as to believe that he is alone in the possession of such yearning. Well, who's he talking about here? Is he talking about uh, Joe Schmo, who sits next to me in synagogue? I don't think so. I think he's talking about some transcendent aspect of the universe. Heschel talked about God in search of man. And I think Kaplan is isolating the impulse, which is behind the belief, he didn't believe in God in search of man because he didn't believe in a supernatural God. But I think here in this sentence, in this statement, one has um, a characterization of what is in back of our belief in God in search of man. One who experiences that yearning in himself cannot be so vain or unreasonable as to believe that he is alone in the possession of such yearning. The most difficult step in achieving faith in God is thus the first one of achieving faith in oneself. So what I wanna say is that prayer was at the center of Kaplan's life. Could we go back to the uh, full screen? Uh, uh, there's one, uh, a couple of very um, interesting incidents in connection with prayer, which illustrate Kaplan's uh, uh, emphasis on prayer. One happens at the Jersey Shore. I come from New Jersey, so I love this um, story. It's also quintessential Kaplan. And if you don't remember anything else from my lecture, maybe you'll remember this. Kaplan was in 1940 at the Jersey Shore with uh, Ira Eisenstein, his son-in-law, and uh, Judith Eisenstein, his daughter. And uh, it was recorded that he davened every single day. Davened every single day with talus and tefillin. That's Mordechai Kaplan, the radical, um, davening. And sometimes, instead of reading from the prayer book, he would put on his talus and tefillin and daven from a chata'am. And sometimes he put on his talus and tefillin and daven from Dewey. 
davening from Dewey. Davening from Dewey. I want you to remember that. It's an easy way. If somebody asks you what Mordechai Kaplan is about, you can tell him he's about davening from Dewey. In other words, he's davening. He's got his talus and tefillin on. But he is reading what uh, a sort of, he is reading what uh, um, what excites him. Kaplan and prayer. Kaplan not only prayed on a regular basis, but he opened his class with a, he taught at the rabbinical school longer than anybody else on the seminary at that time or now, about 50 years from 1909 until 1963. 50 some odd, 55, 56 some odd years. And he sometimes opened his class with a prayer. David, uh, this is text number six. This is a prayer which was told to me by Manny Goldsmith, who was a conservative or a rabbi, that is to say, graduated the seminary, but a follower of a disciple very dedicated disciple of Mordecai Kaplan. And this is the prayer at the beginning of the class. From the cowardice that shrinks from new truths, from the laziness that is content with half truths, from the arrogance that thinks it knows all truth. O Lord of truth, deliver us. Adonai Eloheichem emet. Adonai, you pray that, those of you that daven. The Lord our God is truth. That's uh, Jules Harlow in Sim Shalom, that's the way he translates of the Noel Rechememet. The Lord our God is truth, deliver us. And uh, um, th this illustrates what prayer is about because we want to be delivered from cowardice, from laziness, and from arrogance. And, and we're not asking anybody else to do that for us. We're not asking the world to change. We're expressing our hope. We're expressing our desire. We're trying to remind ourselves of what's important and what are the ideals. And the ideals are to move away from cowardice, to move away from laziness, to move away from, uh, from arrogance. Now, uh, uh, I want to illustrate um, uh, Kaplan's desire for a new uh, liturgy by, I hear something again, uh, Kaplan's desire for a new liturgy by his creation. David, do we have, uh, I don't know how we can do this. I'm sorry, Mel, you need to unmute. I muted you by accident. Okay. Okay, uh, okay. I think we're good now. Kaplan wanted to create new prayers so people would be able to relate more directly to the prayers. And he created two prayers by taking essays and turning them into poems. There's a lot of people here that are very creative. And I want you to try sometimes to take an essay and turn it into a poem. Uh, my wife has done it very, very effectively. Kaplan does it on the basis of Emerson. And when I discovered this is in volume three of my communings. And if you want the whole poem, you will have to buy the book. <laughs> and when I discovered this, I went out of my mind because what Kaplan was telling me is that I must daven from Emerson. Daven from Emerson. And I, Kaplan's telling me I must pray from Emerson. I have to read Emerson's essays, which I did. And I have to read Emerson uh, biography, which I did. I got knee deep into Emerson. I'm much more in a certain sense an Emersonian than I am a Kaplanian. I, I, I got so deep into Emerson, I couldn't get out for 10 years. Really, I, I was reading, I was obsessed with Emerson and everybody connected with Emerson. Anyway, here is text. Uh, number seven, I think, David. Mm -hmm. Now, the point is that the, the, the language 
here is the language of Emerson, not Kaplan, but it's made into a poem. And this is that my, my phone, I'm sorry. Uh, this is um, uh, from an essay by Emerson called An Address to the Harvard Divinity School um, in 1838. And I'm not comparing myself to Emerson, but the point is that when he actually gave this address to the Harvard Divinity School, there was a very, very small audience, <laughs> 20 or 30 people. So we're doing much better than Emerson. Anyway, listen to what Kaplan says we have to pray from. He who makes me aware that I am an infinite soul heartens me. He who gives me to myself lifts me. He who shows God in me fortifies me. <clears throat> he who hides God from me destroys the reason for my being. The divine prophets, bards, and lawgivers are friends of my virtue, of my intellect, and of my strength. Noble provocations go out from them, inviting me to resist evil. But let us not speak of revelations as something long ago given and done. Only by coming to the God in ourselves can we grow forevermore. That line is just a, an absolute, it's an unbelievably powerful line that characterizes Kaplan's religion and characterized Emerson's religion. And of course, uh, what he means, what Emerson means is, and what Kaplan understood as the God in ourselves is the matter of our reason of following Shema, we pray, Shema, listen, listen. And you got to listen to that inner voice, which is the voice of reason. When you're thinking of doing something that you know you shouldn't do and listening to the voice of conscience, God speaks to us. It's a very old idea um, in religious literature and in religious thinking that God speaks to us uh, through our conscience. Um, okay, I'm going a little bit long here, but I just want to mention a few other things. I want to say that Kaplan created a prayer on the basis of a Heschel essay. Heschel came to uh, Cincinnati in 1940, and uh, after two years, um, he had spent time in England learning English. He wrote a, uh, an essay called An Analysis of Piety, and Kaplan saw it, and he liked it, and he got in touch with Heschel, and he eventually um, uh, uh, created a, a poem prayer on the basis of um, that uh, on the basis of that essay. Um, now I I think uh, uh, I have another. Yeah, let's go to text number eight. I don't know what happened to the to the Heschel. The Heschel essay is there. What I want to illustrate is I want to illustrate by this. Um, uh, selection from October 1940 about Kaplan's attitude towards uh, worship. Worship should be rendered in such terms as produce the following. Two results. One, it should send forth a person exhilarated and strengthened to do the best and to bear the worst. That was Kaplan's definition of religion. It should help you to be the best, to do the best, to be the best, and to bear the worst. I mean, what more could you ask? That's a lot to ask, but that was Kaplan's idea. Um, it should make clear to him that the source of this exhilaration and strength is God. The traditional services fail to produce either result for the modern Jew. We owe it to ourselves and to our community to stem the growing tide of godlessness by evolving a type of worship that will produce these two results. If the first or the second time we fail to achieve the desires Results we must keep on trying so uh, until we succeed. So I want to read you just a couple of lines before I finish. Um, I appreciate your your patience with me, but I get a little bit uh, out of hand. <laughs> Can we go back to the regular screen? Um, this is a, a poem prayer using the language of Heschel, which is in Kaplan's prayer book. It's also in my volume number three. I'll read you just a couple of lines. It's about piety. And Heschel 
in this wonderful, wonderful poem, Kaplan is saying, you understand what's happening here. Kaplan is saying, pray from Emerson and pray from Heschel. Pray from Emerson and pray from Heschel. And in the 19, um, early 1940s, uh, Kaplan had the very radical idea of having a loose leaf prayer book, a loose leaf prayer book. And uh, um, I was examining the papers of Ira Eisenstein, and I came across a, 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 a um, I came across one of these prayer books, and I opened it up, and there was Heschel and Emerson facing each other in the prayer book. In the prayer book. I'll tell you the truth. I was in the Kaplan archives and I started to cry. I mean, it was such a, a magnificent spiritual uh, moment. Anyway, Heschel got into Kaplan's 45 prayer book. Emerson never did. So uh, Heschel uh, um, and the Heschel poem, it's called The Pious Man. And we find the following about faith and piety. Faith precedes piety. Piety is faith's achievement. Faith desires to meet God, piety to abide by him. Faith strives to know his will, piety to do it. Faith yearns to hear his voice, piety to respond to it. So this is the kind of ideal. And I'm going to skip uh, number nine, David, because I think we've gone on long enough. And I want to end with the last word, I haven't said anything really about the war. There's a great deal that Kaplan writes about fascism and its nature. I haven't said anything about Israel and Kaplan writes about the establishment of the state and he's very, very excited about it. I haven't said anything about the death of Roosevelt and so on and so forth, which Kaplan was really, really, he was knocked off. He, he, he was very, very, very upset, as so many people were. Um, uh, so I had to make a choice in terms of the limited time I have, which I think, <laughs> I think I've think i exceeded. Um, but I want to give you one last word. All of this material is in the book. And so if you can't sleep, um, you know, at three o'clock in the morning, you can get up and read your copy of Communities of the Spirit. Um, and see what Kaplan has to say. So I wanna say one last word, which is Kaplan um, was not only devoted to the Jewish people, he was also an internationalist. He longed for peace in the midst of the war. He longed for peace in which there would be no war, not just a cessation of hostilities, but a permanent cessation of war. And this meant not using force to resolve conflicts. It meant also giving up some sovereignty because he talked about disarmament and so on and so forth. So let's go, if we can, David, to the last um, text. No, there we go. This is from 1942. The contribution which Judaism has made should continue to make to democracy and the American way of life is summarized in the motto enunciated by the prophet Zechariah, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And to add the supplement of Hillel's famous summary of Judaism, the rest is commentary, go and learn. And those of you who daven, and those of you who know something, which many of you do, because you're a very special group of people, know that this um, uh, chapter from Zechariah is uh, the Haftarah on the Shabbat of Hanukkah. It's obviously a kind of a protest against the, the uh, uh, feedback about his 1945 prayer book. Anyway, let me finish and we'll get to that David Goldstein. Um, that, uh, that model means that the criterion of human good of that which renders life worthwhile should not be power, bigness, but the extent to which it expresses the spirit of God. Democracy begins with the refusal to bow before might, to glorify and worship mere force. The only thing that deserves respect, admiration, is that which has in it a spark of the divine. Okay, so that's my 
my presentation. Wonderful. Uh, well, thank you so much. So um, uh, what I'm, I'm going to do, you go uh, ahead. I'm sorry, I went on a little bit long. Not a problem. <laughs> um, there, there are uh, several questions. Um, so let me share them with you. And while you're answering the questions, I will also um, share a screen with information for people who want to uh, know how to purchase the volume. So the first question I've can got do, is- David, uh, yeah. can we do that? Because people will start to leave as they get tired. I'll do so it immediately, but let me begin with a question. Okay, so he who, this is from Andrew Siegel. Um, no, no, no. David, David yes. uh, I want to say a word about buying the book now. Oh, okay, so I'll do that right now. Um, let, yeah. me, let me share that. Um, there we go. And let me expand it so that people can see it. Okay? Okay. Now, the what you will see is you see the covers of each of my books, and you will see that if you go to Wayne State University Press, who publishes these books, and you will see, um, if you click Mel Skulf, then you will see these books will come up, and if you buy one of the books, you'll see the full price, the price of this book being $39, but if you go and you purchase it at the checkout, you write in mail one, mail one, there's a little box, it says code mail one, and that will give you a 30% discount, a 30% discount on my biography, which is that white book on the top. It's a full biography of Mordecai Kaplan, and uh, the blue book, the purple book is 1913 to 1934. It's 400 pages, um, as is the red book. Um, 34 to 41, and the green book, which is the most recent, which is 42 to 51. Yes, thank you very much, David. Okay, lovely. Um, so let me, um, the first question, a questioner wants to know, um, what does Kaplan make of a god who sometimes for no reason hides God's self? How does Kaplan avoid incarnation with the use of the concept of God in ourselves? So that's two questions. What does Kaplan make of a God who, um, who seems to hide God's self for no reason? And what about the notion of incarnation with a God who is in ourselves? Okay. <laughs> uh, theology is a lifelong pursuit. And I have been suing, pursuing those questions for many, many for decades. Um, but standing on one foot, I would say, as to the first part of what you're saying about God hiding himself, Kaplan doesn't have that, that problem. He doesn't have that problem because he doesn't believe in a supernatural God who can hide himself. The traditional person has that problem. And that problem is the, is the problem of um, um, the problem of evil, of theodicy. How do, you rec how do you reconcile a God who cares with the destruction that we experience in the world? And one of the ways was answered by the psalmist and by the Torah, which is that God hides himself. And that was a major way in the Middle Ages that Jews reconciled themselves to um, the um, um, suffering that they experienced, which they didn't expect to suffer. Um, um, the second question, the God in yourself is a very, very difficult issue. Um, the, the, I want to mention two points. First of all, uh, uh, it's it, the God in yourself, Kaplan makes it very, very clear that it, it is the, the ideals that we believe in, the ideals of justice, the ideal of mercy, uh, of, 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 of compassion. It's those ideals which constitute the divine, those ideals themselves. And I have been reading in Santayana 
because Kaplan read Santayana, and I read whoever Kaplan read, and Kaplan uh, and Santayana talk about ideals as having power. They move us. I think of all those rabbis who stand on the corner of 72nd Street, uh, for those of you in New York, it's on the west side, uh, on Friday, and uh, 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 show their, their uh, unity with the mosque that's at that place. And I think that the ideal of unity uh, has power because it moves them. I mean, that's what Santiana is saying. And to the degree that it has power, it has reality. And uh, uh, that reality is what constitutes the divine for Kaplan. But there's something more than that. And that is difficult to put my finger on because Kaplan is not satisfied with um, the idea of the subjective belief in the ideals. When he discovered that essay by Heschel, Heschel was saying that the uh, ideal of piety is objective. He uses that term. The ideal of piety is objective. And what, what Heschel means is it exists apart from human behavior. Uh, and that's not difficult to uh, associate with uh, Heschel, but Kaplan got excited about the essay by Heschel because of that issue. And he believed in it himself. So that's a little bit about the complicated nature of Mordechai Kaplan, the theologian. Okay, great. Um, Rabbi Jan Kaufman wants to know whether Kaplan had relationships with politicians and whether he ever uh, expressed opinions regarding politicians or politics. Uh, well, I, I, I think Kaplan had uh, relations um, with uh, 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 sort of a, a number of uh, leading Protestant thinkers, John Haynes Holmes. Uh, I mean, there were people, uh, they tended to be uh, religious types uh, who were activists, uh, uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, he didn't have direct uh, relations with uh, any uh, politicians. Ka Kaplan was very, very, very concerned about um, uh, economic and 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 political uh, issues, um, and it's very interesting that people forget how uh, radical Kaplan was when it comes to economics. Uh, I know it's not exactly the question um, that you're asking, um, uh, but it indicates what his values were, which is what you're interested in. And um, so I prepared a number of extra readings. <laughs> so I should run out. I'm always afraid I'm gonna run out of material. Um, and this is from volume two of my communings, February 10th, uh, 1935. This is to indicate Kaplan's economic radicalism, which you didn't ask about, but it, it sort of is related in a certain way. There is much in communism, which I regard as indispensable to the welfare of society. Can I read that again? There is much in communism, which I regard as indispensable to the welfare of society. Some of it I openly avow and preach. You can believe that the uh, people at the SAJ were disturbed when Kaplan preached in that way. The doctrines of a classless society, of the abolition of profit and the principle from each according to his abilities and to each according to his needs, I have preached from the pulpit and am embodying me in an essay that I am writing. So, <laughs> you know, uh, and Kaplan said at one point that there were really two people there. It was Mordechai the capitalist and uh, Menachem the Bolshevik. Um, so he was exaggerating somewhat. But that theme of the dedicate, Kaplan didn't march the way Heschel did. 
And I want to make that clear. I'm not saying that he did. He didn't march. But the point is, um, uh, I'll get to Susan Banker in a minute. Um, uh, Kaplan, Kaplan um, you see, when it, something comes like that, it distracts me. Yeah. So Mel, I'm going to I'm going to keep the question. So you, yeah, you can... yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I forgot I was in the middle of making a point now I forgot yeah, that that Kaplan didn't march. He didn't march no but he had the same ideals as as uh, Heschel and the point is that Heschel didn't march that much either. Uh, Heschel was in touch with you know people like uh, uh, William Sloan Coffin, uh, Martin Luther King who were you know religious figures um, uh, I think rather than politicians I mean Susanna I don't know if Susanna is with us. Is she with us? Um, I don't know. Uh, so the point is that these were religious figures, and Kaplan was in touch with religious figures mm -hmm. of, 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 of the main Protestant and Catholic de denominations. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's go to the next okay, question. Okay, so I, I, there, there are a number of questions still here, but I don't want to keep people too long. So I'm just going to ask two more. Um, one uh, from uh, my colleague in the library, Naomi Steinberger, um, who wants to know whether Kaplan uh, made any reference to the uh, flu pandemic of 1918 uh, in the diaries. Well, I'll tell you the truth. Uh, uh, if you had asked me that question two weeks ago, <laughs> I wouldn't, I would have had to say, no, he doesn't make a a reference to the flu uh, epidemic, but I'm I'm at that stage where I'm, you know, I can see uh, death uh, around the corner, uh, the day after tomorrow, um, and so I'm going through my papers and I discover all kinds of interesting things. When I go through my papers, I have a mess of papers, some of which I'm going to throw across the street to David <laughs> and give to the seminary library. But among the papers, I found a, a, a statement in a in, in a uh, 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 in a work that Kaplan wrote, uh, which I don't have in front of me. But what he said was, he doesn't mention the the, the pandemic uh, of 1918. But what he does is he talks about healing, and he says that healing is a social matter. Healing is a social matter. In other words, what he means is, because in, in previous to this statement and that selection, he talked about the belief in, in the magical. Uh, you know, people believe uh, uh, you can be healed in all kinds of ways. He talks about religion as, um, uh, as healing being a part of religion uh, at the very beginning, uh, the, the, the religious healer. But then he says, what we have to do is we have to be rational and we have to understand that healing is a matter of the social a way in which it's dealt with. And we understand that in terms of the virus the pandemic, uh, the search for a vaccine, the need for everybody to protect themselves. Uh, it's a social issue, which is very, very, very interesting to me. So he does deal with it. Yeah, yeah, no, good. And last but not least, in terms of the questions, there's a question here from someone named Alan Skolt, who I think you might know. Um, <laughs> and, and so I'll read the question, um, you know, exactly. How has your relationship to Kaplan changed over the course of all these years of wandering in the Kaplan desert? Well, the point is that, that every one of my books is devoted to my brother uh, because we talk on the phone every day and uh, um, we have been alienated in the past but now we are very very close uh, my brother uh, is a philosopher he has taught uh, philosophy at drake university and uh, now he lives in philadelphia and so we're very very close i i i started out i guess as a uh, as a biographer, and and biography is a very very important part of my mind. I love biography. I love finding out facts 
that nobody else knows. David Kramer, I'm going to tell you a fact about Solomon Schechter that you don't know. Well, I think you might not know that Solomon Schechter and James Fraser, you remember James Fraser, uh, the Golden Bough, used to walk around every afternoon in the quadrangle between two and four. Do you know this? I didn't know that. That's wow. Well, you see, I'll tell you, I love this story. They used to walk around, they used to share things. And Schechter writes, you know, that he was very much influenced by James Fraser and his notion of folklore in his attitude towards the halakha. Wow. So it's a very interesting thing. And it turns out that Mrs. Fraser was very, very upset because James was so much involved in the afternoons with Solomon. And so what she did is she bought a tandem, you know, a bicycle which two people <laughs> <laughs> which two people could ride. And so uh, uh, Schechter would ride with her, uh, excuse me, uh, her husband James Fraser would ride with her and not be so involved with Schechter. So that story has nothing to do with Kaplan, but it, so I didn't finish what I was saying because what I have, what has happened to me is I have moved from the biographical to the philosophical um, in the last five, five or 10 years, I would say. And so my book, uh, The uh, Radical American Judaism of Mordecai Kaplan, which is published by Indiana University Press um, and which is still available, um, uh, deals with the philosophical. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, and, and the theological. Uh, Alan and I talk about the presence of God and the way in which we can have a natural presence of God and what that means. And so I'm, but I don't forget about the philosophical. I don't forget about the biographical because it, it's still part of who I am. Great. Well, I, I, we're all very thankful that you're interested in both the biographical and the philosophical because it's made this a very rich presentation. The, thank you for your choices. And we really are extremely appreciative uh, for everything that you've shared. Thank you all for joining us for this wonderful presentation and discussion. And we hope that you'll consider joining us again for future book talks uh, in their variety. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I wish you well, uh, health and safety, uh, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Mel. I, I want, just want to thank you, David, for having me. I very, very much appreciate this forum, very much, and okay. I thank you. Oh, sure, and I want to actually, before people are off, I want to um, thank uh, our assistant at the library, Bernie Silverain, who uh, helps to make sure that these events go off without a hitch, um, and she deserves a, a lot of our gratitude as well. Okay, yeah. good night, all. Great dealing with her, thank you.